So if you're tuning in for this, I'm just putting the um. This is the second uh, part of me retouching this uh, this brick, and uh, I've done a fair, I've done a half an hour's work to it already. Bringing out a few of the details. Hopefully in the next 10, 15 minutes I should be on top of it and have this to a satisfactory state. Quite pleased with it, you know. It's, it's interesting reworking your work like this. It's not something I'm used to doing really, so it's an experiment for me as well. But then I'm used to <laughs> most of what it do is pretty to some extent experimental in the chaos department, not planned, well orchestrated. So yeah, <coughs> this is uh, Pista, the original I called, um, well it's Apophenia, Apophenia. A P O P H E N I A, and that to some extent means to assemble incoherent images into a coherency. Which, when you see the finished image, you'll understand why, but it's uh, it's not really an indication of the um. It's more what I, I'm saying is uh, about what I can see in people rather than this is a friend of mine, April's portrait. And uh, when I reassemble them, which you may have seen, they're called, I think there's Apophenia 1 to 8. And I could have done more. I've got, I've got probably enough. Uh, I did about. 16, 17 different versions of this portrait in different media. This was one of the, I think this was the first one. And this one got saved. It might not have been the first one, but it certainly got saved. I haven't cut this one up, but the other 15, 16, 17 did. And I cut them into contour, contour shapes. And when I put them all together, they reassemble into April's Facebook made out of various different medias and approaches to the same portrait which is why I call them panatrites that makes sense, see what I'm saying? multiple takes on the same person the same image I'm very interested in, well I think I've successfully complexified it all, all I've got to do now is do the, uh, the groundwork and I'm sort of working on that on the uh, current series of paintings but that is a long ongoing I've got all it planned, I've got it all planned out, it's just getting the paintings done now it's taken the best part of a year to get, well it's taken a year to get and the paintings are taking a while to put together for that particular project but so far so good and it is a development what I, from what I've done with the uh, portrait project that I did with uh, April's portraits and others, numerous others. I'm going to be doing one where I'm uh, doing a family portrait where I expand them out into strips. There's four members of the family, but I'm going to stack all of those images on top of each other. And for me, the way I sort of pitched it to the uh, person that I'm doing this at their family, is that I sort of see those stripes that the penetrates are cut up into as um, almost like colour versions of Gino, uh, the 
when you see the GTCI mapping, uh, the genome mapping, uh, it's not just for humans, for all sorts of creatures. And it comes in those stripes. We've all seen it, haven't we? In the detective movies. But I also see those penetrates as a bit like the, uh, the visuals that you get when you're you used to get when you were defragging your hard drive in the old days when you had to almost do that manually rather than your hard drive just to, it will get done for you once a month anyway automatically. But a friend of mine saw them and I like this description he said there. They look to him like people disappearing into their own echo chambers and tunnels. Which is pretty apt. I think there's been a lot of that. No matter how much of a truth seeker you think you are. Both conspiracy theorists and scientists are going to have to come to terms with the fact that there isn't an easy way of discerning conspiracy theory from creative thinking. And all scientists, just like all artists, engage in conspiracy. I sold myself the conspiracy as a kid that I'd be a great artist. Scientists sell themselves a conspiracy that whenever they decide to engage upon that, whatever, you sell yourself a conspiracy. I'm not advocating conspiracies when I say that. I'm, that's as much of a problem for a conspiracy theorist, or, but it's, it's part of creative thinking, sadly. I think the conspiracy that I've perpetually been involved in is conspiring to make you think that this sort of dimension suppression is actually not happening. And it is. I'm suspending, like, I, I'm using a three-dimensional some, somebody that, or something that actually exists in a physical reality, you say, and then flattening it all out. And I'm seeing all of that through two independent uh, visual sources, through my uh, binocular vision, as I was explaining on the first half of this. And then my brain, through its, like a, all of us have as a credible capacity for complex visual thinking, conforms that all into one image in real time, and I don't even think about it, because there doesn't even seem to be any lag between what my perception through the feel in my hand and what I see, it doesn't feel like two different images, but it is. You close one eye and point at the corner of the room and then close the other eye and don't move your head, you'll find one, one hand is pointing at the corner of the room and one isn't. And that's because both your left eye and right eye are seeing slightly independent things and your brain must conform that into one image and that's what that's what happens when you're painting is that you know something that I've realized probably over, over the course of doing these images is a lot of this is internal resource no matter what is external this is something that I think Cezanne was on to and People would, Picasso said that what we get from Cezanne is, uh, is his anxiety. And what he means by that is the double mark. And that anxiety is coming through him realising that he's probably subconsciously, not consciously, that he was getting his information through two independent resources and yet projecting it back out as one resource. And that's where the double line comes in. 
One's the left eye, one's the right eye. Which one's right? <laughs> a bit of a confusing question when it's loaded like that. And that leads almost instantaneously to Braque and Picasso, who come up with the biggest revolution in Western painting since the inception of perspective. They break the fright. Hockney's got some interesting things to... He's been a, a, a constant source of inspiration intellectually for me, Hockney, in this regard. His examination into lenses and the implications of how humans see and what, how you see inside your mind, as opposed to how you see the external reality, is obviously not the same as how you see your external reality. Things are a lot more chaotic in turn, in, in, with internal vision. And so how do you record that? And that's obviously, as I've just pointed out, that's, that's going to play quite a central role in how you can form an image from your two independent resources. And the implications of most of us now looking through the world for a screen and all of that coming through one lens. And all that one lens does is flatten time out. It's not the idea, I don't think it's the idea of high definition image making, is to just make an ever increasingly large frame size. No. Have multiple perspectives within that frame size. We've now got images so high in their fidelity we can't discern with the human eye, most of us. So that, that's absolutely pointless, unless you use it to bust the frame again, rather than, all you're doing by making a larger frame is flattening time. Anyway, I told you I'd digress, and <laughs> I have done that. I'm nearly done with this now. And there you go, there's a bit of a story to it as well now. I'm sure there's going to be arguments back on that one. I mean, one of the things that Hockney says is that cubism is poorly named. And it's, it's a rich place for exploration. There's a lot to be figured out, yeah. An awful lot. I don't think looking at it through one lens is helping. It's not really how we see the world. It's a, don't get me wrong, it's a brilliant, I use photography all the time. I, it's image making at the end of the day. I don't really see myself fundamentally as a painter or an artist. I'm an image maker, that's what I do. And photography is just one of the tools that you use for image making. But it is different, very different to obviously drawing with two independent hands and from two independent lenses. And they are in, they're not strictly independent, but they are seeing independent things. And there's ramifications and consequences upon how you can form that into a singular image. That's why you get so much idiosyncrasy out of humans when they when they paint and draw just literally within their handwriting it floods out of them because there's a lot of anxiety between even from the how, how you're taking it on board it's we have such a sophisticated visual array to, to play with it takes us generations to figure it out <laughs> Literally what Schopenhauer said. Talent hits a target no one else can hit. Genius hits a target no one else can see. And that's why it always looks like madness. Genius that is, not talent.
Okay, I think I'm going to leave that there. That's, the, as I said, that I mean, it's basically that's that's an A3 print. I'll sign it off. This is Apophenia. Instagram and uh, Facebook are on my YouTube profile page or if you're viewing me on there just drop me a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I receive payment for it. Obviously it's postage and packaging and that's going to differ from where you are on the planet but happy to send them out. Um, yeah, drop me a line, I'll do them to all done. Thanks again for watching and uh, listening. I've done a lot more talking in this one than I did in the last one. But hopefully it gives you a bit of insight into sort of where I'm going and what I'm up to. Thanks again. Bye.